Hello, everyone. Uh, I should probably warn you, uh, this is more like, you know, last six years of my experience. That's how I would summarize this. So for the last six years, I've been exposed to this thing called the blockchain, and I've been actively involved. Uh, and I've probably learned a lot of things by mistakes, by accidents. And uh, my skepticism that has been there previous to that, working in crypto and security, got more and more, how could I say, solidified by this. So, I, I, you know, so if I say something, please, please don't take it personally. If you are one of the people who built a protocol and I say that's something wrong, it's not personal at all. It's just an abstract construct that I think we could improve. And if you think I could help you, just come and talk to me, I'll happily help you. I'll always have, will be willing to have a cup of coffee with anybody who builds a protocol. Cup of coffee, okay? You should go away and build it yourself. Don't ask me to build it for you. So this is generally what happens all the time, right? So there are a bunch of crazy guys or crazy girls or crazy people who go around uh, smoking pot or drinking coffee and then they wake up and go, you know what? It'll be nice if he had X. And then they go build it, right? And that's what literally happened. It's like, you know, there was this problem of offline double spend. Somebody fixed the problem and somebody else recognized, you know what, the way this has been done, we could do slightly better. We could have ability to attach data to policies. And that's how the whole thing started out, right? That's just a start. And one of the things you should always recognize is the people who actually normally start a revolution never be the last person standing. That's a normal thing to happen. Does that make sense? So in most, and especially when there's a revolution that has implications to governance. Let me rephrase that again. So if you ever invent something that has significant impact to the nation states of the world, try not to be around when that's obvious to everybody. Okay? So uh, the, the thing that I wanted to explain here is like, when we think about tokens, we are more along the way here. Why is this thing not, oh, okay. Somewhere here, okay? We have no real products. Okay, let me try to describe this slightly better. In the age of Edison and Tesla, they had to bloody build their generators, build their trans, okay, Edison didn't have transformers, he was having DC, so he can't do transformers, okay? So I was wrong in that one. Tesla could have transformers, and he would have built his transformers, and he would have designed his plugs. And right now, we are in a stage that we don't give a shit about, you know, what it is. We know it's AC, alternate current, mostly 50 or 60 cycles. Some parts of the world, there's slight changes, either 110 volts or 230 volts, right? And we just plug out, and there are standards for every country. We kind of know. We still need to carry universal adapters around the world if you travel a lot. But you still know if you plug your thing in, as in like your device in, you just have to pay the charges for that, but you still get a standardized form of electricity. That's where the utility function is truly understood. Everybody understands what that is. When it's here, nobody really knows. Absolutely nobody knows. There's a huge information asymmetry between this place and that place. And we are still in the discovery mode. We are trying to build things, and we are trying to build as we go along. So what literally is happening is there's lots of learning that's happening. And sometimes the learning could be in the right direction, sometimes it's in the wrong direction. And I am doing this talk being a skeptic. Please don't, you know, again, please don't be offended. It's just a way of looking at it in a slightly optimistic, sorry, pessimistic way. Right, so everybody knows what crypto economics is. And I'm not going to, but... Okay, so for me the real difference in everybody talks about it is the differentiation in two things. And I really don't know if this is going to be real uh, going beyond the next few years. Uh, I'll explain why. I, I just had a conversation with one of the previous speakers, and we were talking about what happens next, right? Currently, economics is defined as the way you do supply and demand of goods and other things. The perception of supply and demand of goods and uh, services is a, a signal in your brain, okay? And right now, all of econ what economics is kind of describing is the assumption that's all real. You are moving into a world where that is no longer real. And part of tokenization is actually that. Does that make sense? So this bit, why is it? Oh, OK, all right, sorry. 
Oh, man, this is so bad. Okay, so here, here you go. Oh, man, this is terrible. Okay, so in a decentralized digital economy, right? So the thing that we need to understand is the concept of anything be digitalized is literally the difference between our definition of physical versus virtual. Can we agree on that one? So if we have the ability to have brain-computer interfaces, everything that's real could be virtual. Everything that's virtual could be real. OK? We all agree? So at that point in time, do you think economics as a sense is anything more than crypto economics? Show of hands, who thinks that will be the case? I think crypto economics will be like uh, you know, overpowering economics in a very short period of time. OK? So now, my uh, pet peeve. So you know, I wandered into the land of puzzles, and I ended up playing a lot with it and getting hooked on it. It's a very bad thing to do. Don't ever do this. Don't ever get interested in crypto. But that's something you need to know if you really want to verify anything. It's your choice, right? It's, it, it's a double-edged sword. Now, uh, security engineering. I, I just wanted to give you the notion about things before I go ahead and you know uh, s s s draw lines, right? So people here already talked about engineering, right? And uh, there is this concept of, I think, cryptographic engineering and security engineering. Let me walk backwards. So, uh, who here has actually written crypto libraries? Okay, good. So one of the things that you notice, very important things you notice, is that writing crypto libraries is not equivalent to having understood the crypto in a textbook. There's a ton of nuances that need to be done the right way around, so a crypto library could be done in a reasonably secure manner. Okay, that's one. Now add one more layer of abstraction, okay? Security engineering, right? Crypto is just a primitive crypto, and you are actually creating a bunch of characteristics on top of it. So double in direction, okay? And now we were previously talking about characteristics of tokens, and we are assuming behavior of tokens based on two layers of abstraction, okay? So you believe, A, somebody's math is right. Second, somebody else believe of the math is right, and the way they implement things is right, and then the belief system of the security model they, they build this thing is to be right. And that is your behavioral model for your token. Okay? Okay, and uh, one of the things that uh, I really want to highlight is, I think we should start thinking about things slightly differently. As the world is going forward, as economy is going to merge into economics, the adversarial actors that we have are definitely going to be nation states. It's not going to be kid around the corner. We need to think about security parameters in a way that we have the ability to resist or at least understand. There's a definition between understanding and resisting. The lower limit would be just understand or distinguish. That's the way I would describe it in a computational sense, okay? That we have an adversary, an adversary is acting on us. Because the pace at which things are progressing, if we don't even have that ability, we could be totally owned. OK, so provable security, essentially what it says is like, you come up with a model, you describe a model, and say, OK, this is how the adversarial model will work. So imagine this question about, we always talk about oracles, right? The oracle is a provable security construct. So it's like, you can have an oracle. What it says, you can ask arbitrarily many, not arbitrarily, infinitely many, if, if it's like a, a full oracle in that sense, you can ask infinitely many questions, and you know, you see if you could actually find out something by just asking questions. And the simplest way to describe it is like 20, 20 questions, right? We, you all, you've all played the game 20 questions, right? No? Like, people, kids play the game, apparently. I don't know, I don't have kids. But you know, I, I, that's, <laughs> that's what I've been told. It's like, uh, you know, it's, it's like passing a binary tree, essentially, right? You, you divide and conquer. So you know, the thing I was describing is like we already had all these constructs, and we have been using this construct to actually do other things, and these constructs have been more formalized and have been made available for people to actually create tighter boundaries for people to build protocols on. 
A lot of the protocols that we have have some of this characteristic. At the same time, I should warn you, not everybody agrees with it. Does anybody recognize Alfred Menezes? OK, no. Okay. Oh, you do. OK. So the, the, he is one of the people who actually did a lot of the initial work on ellipticus. Both Koblitz and Alfred Menezes are the two people who did the largest amount of you know, crypto work on ellipticus. And they you know, have this disagreement over this. So even though I'm kind of saying that it is possible to have some sense of a notion of uh, what do I call rigor, there are people who are real fathers of the field who have questions about it. So, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. I, I don't know, but we, we need to have better mechanisms. That's what I'm saying. I'm just offering you mechanisms that exist. And I'm going to walk you through examples of what happened previously. Yeah, I mean, the reason I wanted to just, uh, you know, give you the notion of complexity classes is like, a lot of our notions of security are based on notions of complexity classes and membership to those no, no, complexity classes. But unfortunately, there are very few mechanisms to validate it beyond, like, uh, you know, loose sense, a mathematical sense of doing stuff, right? Uh, okay, fine. I already mentioned it. Okay, so just to give you an idea of like what a nation state adversarial actor would look like, I pretty much, I'm sure everybody would recognize at least one or two of them. And you've already seen how they act. Not in a crypto sense, though. If, if you look at like, you know, uh, I, I don't know, give me an example. Uh, uh, you know, the Democratic, uh, during, during the elections, you know, what happened to Democrats, right? So that's an adversarial action by a na nation state, right? And you can actually see the implications of such things happening. You can always think such a thing could happen to any crypto system. If there was an economic incentive or a political incentive, there's a real, real big problem we have when we actually design protocols. We normally always assume A, all actors are logical, B, all incentives are economic. We have another domain that's being described here. It's a political domain. And you can have actors that act with, it's a, it's a totally uh, orthogonal dimension in that sense. And you have no control over or that game that's happening there. OK, I'm just giving you a notion of what, what can happen, right? OK, now, now I'm going to walk towards tokens. And I'm just going to you know, give you the notion of what really tokens have been around and how it has evolved in time, right? Everybody recognizes those things. You recognize those things. And in, in a way, when you talk about this, you know, classification of tokens, and sometimes you talk about, you know, these tokens, they already existed. Some of the tokens, like, they already existed, but they were not ERC-20, and the way they were used were very different, okay? So you have access tokens. Kerberos version 5 actually has an access token in that sense. The ticket granting server will give you a ticket that gives you access to a service with actually, you know, the bound. So in your Windows directory, anybody who actually understands a thing called Windows, uh, you know, there's such a thing. You actually have tokens in your machine. Okay, your context actually has a token, right? So there exist all these things. We haven't applied crypto economics on to active directories and actual services yet, but it is very possible that someday that might happen. I don't know. God forbid. Okay, so I also want to give you a notion of other token that already existed, and it existed for the last 10 years, right? That's what AWS is. It's like, what AWS is, is a credit, it's a token. You actually have a token for access to an instance for a period of time. Okay, so, you know, all these behaviors have been around, and there have been very interesting attacks on all these tokens in that sense. So uh, one of the attacks that actually happened is like, that's how the spot pricing appeared. It's like, they figured out that people would actually buy AWS and then think about you know, giving it to other people at a spot price. And there's an arbitrage between the price of a regular buy versus somebody who actually needs it then and there. Okay? So this could happen to your, even our tokens. I don't know if that arbitrage already happens. I don't know if there are services that we could actually really buy and sell with ERC-20 tokens, apologies if there's anything that's there that's really real, okay? So, you know, the challenge is like, if you have that, then definitely an arbitrage market opens up. And, uh, you know, there has been some changes that happen. It's like, if you look at it, prices come down. It's like from 2013 to 2017, I don't have the latest one. But, you know, the same thing would happen to our tokens as well. Could go down or go up, we don't really know. And this is why, you know, when the question of stability was asked, I was like, who knows? 
whether something is good or bad, we will only find out in hindsight in some ways. Okay, now, now I'm gonna just jump to the next bit, like pretty much the whole of the you know, token engineering bit and the whole of the blockchain is based on the power of PRFs or hash functions, right? And I'm gonna take uh, you know, one example from history to just give you a notion of what happens if, right? And why we should actually think about things all through the stack in, when we design things, okay? So there is this thing called, oh, why is it not moving? Uh, okay. Right, okay, and uh, yes, sorry. So whenever you come up with something, say a hash function, what they do is they have a whole suite of tests they run before they ever accept anything, okay? I'm just giving you examples of what has happened, real life ones, I'm not kidding, I'm not lying to you, you can Google it, and mostly it's from Wikipedia, so I did it that way, so you can go check it, because this, there's a bias of me telling you bullshit, that's really easily verifiable. I took it from Wikipedia, so you know you can always people can bullshit on Wikipedia too. But you know there's a, a papers published and all those things. So if you ever propose a hash function, if you take the crypto, you know even before you put it to a crypto community, there's this suite of tests they run, okay? And only if it gives you a very normal distribution, they will accept it. Otherwise, they'll be thrown out straight away. You won't see. You won't even see the door. And even even after that, this happened, right? Okay. So. Rivest is the R of RSA, okay? He's like a super smart guy. He's the guy who invented Rivest Shamir Alderman asymmetric stuff, right? And he actually was also uh, interested in hash functions. He actually created MD4, and MD4 was attacked, so he came up with an MD5, right? And uh, you know what happens? This is something that you should notice. It's like. The acceleration of pace of attacks and how things really go kaput. There was like a limited pseudo collisions in 93, and then there was like a compression function kind of compromised, and then somebody did the brute force, and by the time the brute force was there, somebody revealed the fact, this is a very interesting twist, they revealed the fact that they have totally bro broken it. And you need to understand, this is very interesting in the concept of crypto economics in the global sense. Imagine you have an information advantage of ad, uh, being able to break a crypto analytical break of a hash function, okay? Somebody was talking about finality before. Imagine you have a superpower now, right? You have the ability to find as many collisions the way you want. They were talking about Chinese having computational power. If Chinese had the ability to cryptonize hash functions, imagine the state of affairs. Thankfully, QCs, uh, quantum computers, don't actually give that much of a brute force thing. You, you just get a square root 10. So you still, if it's a 256 bit, you get two to the power 128 strength in that sense. But that's not the real strength. Look at MD5. MD5 is pretty big. But the attack was so fast that we actually had a lot of problems. If people remember here, there was uh, GitHub submissions that were having collisions. There were certificates that were having collisions. So once a hash function is broken, you will have a lot more trouble. And one of the things I would say to everybody is like, when you make assumptions, have a backup plan. Okay, what happens if? And one of the problem, biggest problems with hash function is you would lose your ability to create Merkle trees straight away. Am I making sense to you? You can't go back and you can't say, okay, this is a you know, well stated state, because you totally lost it unless you have multiple hash functions running with uh, uh, along your crypto or oh, five minutes. Okay, I need to do faster. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna just uh, talk about like, you know, a few things and stop it. So currently speaking, we have like a bunch of things. I nicked it from restaurant. Okay, okay there. he's there. Uh, so, you know, you can pick one of them. I was just thinking about curve burning and I was just about to give you an example of one of them. Everybody knows curve burning. There's nobody in this room probably who doesn't know this. So what I'm saying is the following, right? So you can have curves that are orthogonal. You can have games between the two curves. Let, let me create this. Uh, yesterday I met somebody who was actually you know, having this app which allows you to you know, sell your time for things. I, I took Trent as an example. He has expertise in more things. So what I said is like, imagine there's a bonding curve for Trent's time for computation and blockchain. There's one other curve for Trent's time in uh, VLSI design. Another curve for trends time in, in AI, right? And you can actually have an arbitrage. If I had this ability to see the market 
and have more information than Trend has, I could actually do a proxy and then gain more thing than I could do rent seeking even with Trend being optimal on a morning curve. Does that make sense to you? So this is something we need to understand. There are games that are outside the bound of the bonding curves and the plane at which you have optimized the game. Am I making sense? There is information leakage that happens between planes. And if you are not even aware of it, you could be gamed. You would still believe that you are playing the optimal game, but your optimal game is suboptimal across multiple planes. Okay, so this is what I was just thinking, like, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. There's always, you know, hierarchy of things. And for things you actually want, you could actually use the right tool. You don't actually need to have a jackhammer to drive a nail. You can find the right kind of hammer to do it, right? Uh, simulation definitely is not verification. Please understand. Okay, that's very huge difference. Probabilistic verifications is probabilistic. What you want is far better bounce than that. Oh, sorry. Uh, why is it jumping like that? Okay. Uh, formal verifications is not B and on and all. It is very useful. It will help you find, you know, structures and, you know, a bit more better notions of security. Always acknowledge existence of ch side channels. If you have better handle on the existence and how much is being leaked, you are better off. And as always, I would like to say this, you know, it is very possible we are being tokenized in an alternate reality. <laughs> I don't know where that reality is. If you find it, let me know. Thanks. Um, I'm assuming there will be some questions, so any takers? Ah, go for it. Can you give an example for verification? Uh, verification, good question. What did you say your name was? Volkan. Okay. I can do a verification by reading here. So essentially, it's, it could be like in, interactive verification or non-interactive verification. But it's, 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 it's like, it's a com forward commitment and a reveal in that, in, in a loose sense of speaking. So you make a claim, that's a forward commit, and then you do a reveal, and the reveal actually translates to whatever you committed. That's essentially what it is. Okay. Oh, he wants that. You're not allowed to ask questions. Is this working? Okay, cool. It's a question that will maybe help clarify for the audience. So, and uh, could you give an example of arbitrage of a market maker, say Bancor, with a regular cryptocurrency exchange? So let's say that, yeah. Uh, could you repeat So you're talking about arbitrage of me. <laughs> and that's, uh, cool, thank you. Um, um, and, um, and that's maybe harder for some to relate to. It's very easy for me to relate to. Um, but uh, you know, let, let's say that the Bancor, Bancor is a um, market maker yeah. um, for liquidity. Yeah. Um, but of course, uh, it might not be efficient compared to other um, exchanges, right? Yeah. So uh, could you describe how someone make, might make money by arbitraging price discovery? It's, uh, you know, pretty easy if you could front run it and then sell it off if you want to. That's one way to do it. Too. That way, why easy way to? Do it. I'm after easy things. Anybody, I mean, I, okay. Look, I'm not going to come up with schemes to do. <laughs> so I can, you know, there are notions of a whole set of things you could do. Effectively, what it means is like you know something ahead of time and you have the ability to actually, you know, make sure it's what it is. And then, uh, in a world, you can do forward commit. And when the reveal happens, you get rewarded. That's essentially what it is. So, you know, you have a, that's, let me, be, you're okay with that, me saying that, right? I don't want to be held down by people and hold, held responsible by people for giving attacks on protocols and shit like that. So, so what happens if there's three market makers um, against the same token? You are pretty much in big shit. Unless you have enough of resources to fight, you know, fight them out. Um, I have a question. Oh, uh, you're, you're the moderator. You're not asking. No, no. Uh, I can. I can. Um, 
if we are looking at uh, Bitcoin running f since 2009, yeah. um, having crypto from 2005, yeah. um, seeing that hashing algorithms getting hacked on a span of 15 years into less than that, less than that, less than that. Yeah. So probably if we very soon, yes, expect very soon. And I didn't want to say that. What? So, but, but that's NSA, a hint. It is like it's always hints. Uh, why? You yeah. yeah. Don't so, so uh, do you have any? Mystery has to be left. If you say everything, there's no mystery. Why do you write a book? <laughs> so, what's your suggestion for upgradability of crypto in uh, immutable law? So the thing you have to do is, you, you, I was kind of in, uh, alluding to that. You need to have multiple hash functions that overlap in security margins across it. So when actually one goes off, you still have one. So you can go back on that. So you know, if I had a choice on the seat where this was decision was made, I will put take two at least, right? There are a lot of trade-offs. He will probably say the same. But like he, he would have a lot, lot, a lot, lot of hair for hash function debates. So I, I didn't lose a lot of hair because it's like I stand up and say what, what I think and then ignore the rest. So my job essentially, the way I see it, is like you know, call out the truth, be the Socratic pondering in the room, get the other people thinking. If they ask me questions, I will answer. If they don't, then I think I, my you know, you can't fix the world. You know, you can ask the question. You can take the host to the water. The drinking part is up to the host. So. Uh, Pretty much you can tell them, look, you know, you need to have a mechanism by which you have at least two uh, overlapping hash functions in place. But I don't think that will solve the problem. You have the ability to roll it, though. So effectively, if one is broken, you can still use the other one to replace it. So one at a time, you can always replace it, overlapping. True, but when you put those multi-hash functions in place, you're already relying on two old libraries. Yes. If this goes 20 years into existence, then the other one will run out soon, so you have to reseal the entire history. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, you, at any point in time, if you have an overlapping one, you can actually at least have a notion of security for one remaining. Or you can have arbitrarily n in that sense. And you can have a weighted knapsack of the weights of all hash functions in a probabilistic sense. There you go. Let's Sorry. do that. Okay, thanks, Anish. Well, G give it. A